This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. I would like to acknowledge that the University of South Australia meets on the land of the Kaurna people. We wish to express our respect for the Kaurna people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Kaurna people have with their traditional land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal peoples from other areas of South Australia and Australia. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre, University of South Australia and ABC Friends South Australia to our presentation, Disinformation, a toxic mix of media, politics and vested interests. Tonight, we will hear from former Prime Minister, the Honourable Kevin Rudd AC, and Walkley award-winning journalist, Quentin Dempster AM, as they address key questions around disinformation and the ways it has been weaponised in our media to undermine democracy. I would also like to thank ABC Friends for their wonderful assistance in making tonight's event possible. It is now my great pleasure to welcome the Honourable Kevin Rudd and Quentin Dempster. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jacinta, and thanks to the Hawke Centre and ABC Friends South Australia. We're delighted to be joined now by former Prime Minister, former Foreign Minister, uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, noted author. Uh, Kevin, welcome. Uh, Good to be with you, Quentin. What do you mean by disinformation as opposed to misinformation where you could be inadvertently misinformed about something? Disinformation means there's, uh, there's something more sinister, doesn't it? Absolutely. Disinformation as a term means intentionality, um, intentionality to misinform. Um, and it's therefore a de deliberate stratagem, either by a government or um, what I have maintained in the debate concerning the power of the Murdoch monopoly uh, is um, on the part of a corporation, namely News Corporation, uh, to um, uh, create a set of assumptions uh, and frameworks for analysis uh, and, as it were, assume conclusions about realities that are already pre-baked within the, uh, the Murdoch worldview and well, which are then put out there into the public domain as if these are already received truths. Look, uh, we'll get into uh, Rupert first, and before we go to the discussion more broadly, we journalists have been fascinated to watch you and uh, Malcolm Turnbull raise your complaint publicly uh, about news corporation power in Australia, the UK and the United States. Uh, in a nutshell, what's your main objection to Murdoch methodology? He says he's using his outlets as part of a free press in Western civilization to counter what he calls woke orthodoxy. It's a free country. Why can't he do that without you and your supporters trying to harm him financially by your boycott of his real estate uh, website, realestate.com business in Australia? To begin with, um, uh, Quinton, we assume that Murdoch comes to any such public debate with clean, clean hands. He doesn't come to this debate with clean hands at all. Uh, he's been directly interfering, intervening in Australian national politics, British national politics, American national politics for a very long time. It's only, however, just got worse. Um, and what are the core questions which Murdoch refuses to answer? One, how is it faintly justifiable in any modern democracy for a single news organisation to have 70% ownership of the print readership of a democracy? and in various parts of uh, that democracy, like my own home state of Queensland or the state of South Australia, to have virtually a 100% uh, print monopoly. That is bad for the democracy, whether they happen to be supporting the progressive side of politics or the conservative side of politics. That's the core thing. The second principal complaint is this, is that Murdoch uh, seeks uh, to uh, use his print monopoly and his wider media powers in order to um, further what is a deeply far-right agenda in politics, but one which also underpins his interests as a media company as well. 
and that therefore we see the monopoly being used quite wrongly to advance these commercial interests. We see uh, the monopoly also being used to ferment far-right political interests. And my final complaint is this. In the prosecution of the latter, what he is doing is also actively, consciously balkanizing the politics of this country and the United States and the United Kingdom into uh, sub-constituents of far-right grievance culture, which makes it increasingly unlikely that you can form national political consensus to drive long-term policy reform. And instead, you end up with enclaves of opinion, enclaves of far-right opinion, enclaves which he now seeks to ferment, for example, through Sky News, put out through YouTube, to create these subcultures, which in the United States found their head in the storming of the Capitol on the 6th of January. Uh, we'll get into that uh, shortly into the US, but I just want to be a little bit more domestic at the moment. At the Senate inquiry into media diversity, uh, to which you gave evidence and which was really a uh, response to your, your petition with 500,000 Australians for a, a royal commission into Rupert, most of the other witnesses, Nine Entertainment, Hugh Marks, Guardian Australia's Lenore Taylor, Crikey's Eric Beecher, Peter Frey, The New Daily's Bruce Guthrie and others, all seem to think that after the merger of Fairfax and Nine, Australia wouldn't be able to unscramble this now more consolidated media egg. Would you agree that it's now impractical to deliver more mainstream de media diversity to counter Rupert uh, and all these malign, distorting influences, you say, particularly with the dominance of Google and Facebook hoovering up all that ad revenue in the Australian market, these global interlopers into the Australian market? Well, I have a pretty old-fashioned view on these questions, Quinton, which is uh, democracies ultimately determine their own future through the laws that we make as a commonwealth and as the states. These are instruments of the people, not of corporations, nor are they of markets. And when you have something as fundamental as the lifeblood of a democracy, which is the fair and balanced uh, distribution of news and information and commentary, if you start to corrupt that in a fundamental way, you begin over time to corrupt the democracy, which is why I use the term Murdoch as a cancer on democracy. On the second point that you make, uh, which is uh, recent uh, further exercises in media consolidation, for example, the merger or the acquisition by nine uh, entertainment of, uh, of Fairfax, you're right, that has made the overall diversity uh, reality in Australia. Uh, much worse than it was even before. Um, and in fact, we now have Murdoch representing a far-right media group. We have uh, Fairfax taken over by nine, in my judgment, representing a centre-right media group. And frankly, you've got aunties struggling up the middle, that's the ABC, and you probably have The Guardian uh, as a single online platform representing, as it were, a centre-left perspective. So the deck is already stacked in a very big way. Final point, for the future, um, the reason I have called for a Royal Commission is that it is important that we provide the time and resources to an intelligent Royal Commissioner to examine the future legislative and regulatory options for maximising uh, print and general media diversity in the future. Murdoch is uh, a large part of the problem. He's also a symptom of a wider problem which goes to the, as it were, the commercial viability of media in its traditional form per se, and the inroads, as you say, of the digital platform monoliths. Uh, but it's not beyond the wit and wisdom of someone looking at all the uh, models which are available around the world to come up with a recommended different model for Australia, even though that includes uh, the use of, for example, public funding for, let's call it, um, public interest journalism. Uh, that is also an option for the future. But that's what a Royal Commissioner should do. Do you want a Royal Commission to recommend, if you ever did get one, and I think it's highly doubtful whether uh, Scamo is the Prime Minister or Albo is the Prime Minister, uh, uh, that they, they would ever recommend uh, that uh, News Corporation be forced to divest, say, the Courier Mail and the Sunday Mail or the one newspaper towns that exist uh, uh, in Australia? Well, again, it's a question of the discretion that, a, that we would extend to a Royal Commissioner to look at all the evidence, all the alternative models, and to make recommendations for the future. However, I'm not in the business of learned national helplessness. 
uh, and learned national hopelessness, that it's all too hard, it's all too difficult. Murdoch's a too big a thousand pound gorilla in the, uh, in, the, in the living room and he'll come and rip off your arm before breakfast and suck out your blood as an, uh, as an afterthought for a cocktail. That has intimidated too many people over too long a period of time from not raising these to the center of our national discussion. I didn't enter this debate lightly. I did not engage in this debate for quite a number of years after I left the prime ministership. But having come back to Australia um, for the period of COVID and looked afresh at what had happened uh, with the uh, use and abuse of the monopoly powers by Murdoch, then the merger between Nine and Fairfax and the combined impact on the health of our democracy. It's not a light decision to take on Murdoch. I've taken it. I'm glad to see that Malcolm Turnbull has joined me. And don't um, um, consign us uh, to um, what I would describe as a future which says it's impossible there could be such a Royal Commission. If that was the case, I would not be doing what I am doing. We are in the business of bringing about fundamental social change here. That means driving the politics of the mainstream political parties and in the regions back in the direction of appropriate diversity. That's listen, what our mission is. Listen, I'm going to have to raise this, particularly for the for the Hawke Centre with the revered late uh, Bob Hawke, but you've just reminded me it was Hawkey and Keating who handed Murdoch substantial power by allowing the his acquisition of the Herald and Weekly Times in 1987, including Queensland Press Limited. This allowed Rupert a massive cash flow from highly profitable Australian operation for his other acquisitions in the UK and ultimately uh, the United States. Mr Rudd, it was Hawkey and Keating who did this. Uh, I agree, and it was wrong. Uh, so once you've acknowledged that, uh, the question then is... Uh, what do, uh, how do we do it within the context of the digital revolution, which is when you complain about diversity, there's more diversity than we've ever had before because at the click of the mouse, people can get the New York Times, the Washington Post, infinite websites, every fact-based analysis website. We've got amazing capacity through what is now called the information age. So Rupert, you complained about Rupert uh, while important uh, uh, domestically in Australia, it's just being subsumed by the huge diversity that we've got. I think that's the flaw in your argument, uh, Quinton, uh, which is uh, why I'll take it on head on. But uh, let me back back one minute in terms of uh, the errors of the original decision uh, in 1987. I remember it well. You and I are Queenslanders. We know what happened to the, uh, the Telegraph. Uh, we know what happened with the, uh, the, uh, the interim solution. Uh, the Daily Sun. Uh, we know what happened to the Sunday Telegraph, became the Sunday Sun. And following the Murdoch um, recipe, which is where I believe he did mislead the Hawke and Keating government in terms of his um, long-term plans, he then set about destroying um, those things which uh, he had acquired as separate brands. And so it turned Brisbane back in those days, a much smaller city and a much smaller state, from being, frankly, a two-newspaper town Telegraph, Korea Mail, um, Sunday Mail, Sunday Telegraph, uh, into a one newspaper, one company town. And, uh, and so I don't think Hawke and Keating could foresee where Murdoch would actually take it in the future. But that's history. I've made a plan that I frankly have opposed the decision then. And I certainly oppose the decision now, but just as I oppose the decision uh, taken uh, during the period of the Turnbull government uh, to allow institutions like uh, Murdoch uh, with the revision to the cross-media ownership laws to potentially purchase a television station such as Channel 7. So there have been errors committed all round in terms of previous regulatory regimes. I'm dealing with the future, which is what the hell do we now do to maximise media diversity to preserve the health of our democracy? Um, and on the, um, on the uh, your overall thrust, which is no problem, media has become infinitely more diverse, um, for, the, um, for the chattering classes, uh, including yourself and myself, uh, Quentin, uh, that is true, uh, because we will go and harvest information from the Azerbaijan Daily if we need to, in order to find the racing tips for, them for next Saturday, so down at um, uh, the Azer Azerbaijan Cup, because you and I are nerds and we will do that sort of thing. But you also know more broadly, Quentin, that there is a broader thing out there, it's called the Australian Democracy, 
A lot of people don't consume much by way of news each day. And we do know uh, that uh, traditional platforms have been contract, print platforms have been contracting. We know con commercial television uh, is uh, under deep and fundamental challenge because of also the impact on advertising, uh, both of which are being driven by what's happening in the digital space uh, led by the monoliths. Um, but here is the rub about Murdoch. Murdoch, whatever we may think of him, is, is never done. Murdoch, Murdoch is in the pr process of migrating his print-based monopoly into digital influence writ large in Australia. And he's doing that not just through his uh, own online version of his newspapers. That's the simplest form of communication. The most insidious uh, operation underway is to take, for example, the content, quote unquote, delivered by Sky After Dark, and to then communicate that through Mur uh, Murdoch's um, YouTube channel for Sky News and to pump out bite-sized bite pieces of vile and far-right propaganda uh, out to the same balkanized groups that uh, the Fox uh, network uh, have sought to penetrate over some decades now in the United States. Fox now using digital platforms to do the same. Net effect, um, the Sky News uh, YouTube channel now is bigger than that of the ABCs. Uh, the Sky YouTube channel is bigger than the combined commercial YouTube channels. And, and if you look, for example, at the number uh, of, um, of not just likes, but the number of um, engagements uh, on the part of the Sky News, News uh, YouTube channel, uh, this is growing at a pace of knots, uh, Murdoch's influence across those consuming digital media. Final point is, the product for all this still comes out of a news stable and a news organisation. And the reason why Murdoch still funds a large number of journalists in the country, although a shrinking number, uh, is to provide content ideologically driven to the far right, not just to disseminate through his traditional platforms, perhaps also through a television station if he buys one or can buy one, and not just through a, um, a cable station, which was what uh, Sky News was originally, but now through YouTube, using the channels of the new media to take this far-right content to a whole new audience. And that's what he's doing, and that's why it's dangerous. Well, that's the market. There, there's money in, uh, in disinformation or, uh, or his methodology of, uh, uh, of uh, fear and, uh, and distortion and all that sort of thing. It's not fact-based journalism. It's not public interest journalism. There's money in it, and it's a, it's a uh, free market. Uh, let's talk about regulation. Uh, what about regulation? Because that was uh, uh, not only domestically but internationally because disinformation is a major problem for Western democracies. It, as you say, undermines public trust in the institutions of our democracy and you know, the, the, the drums of war with China and our concern about the authoritarians of, of Vladimir Putin, what have you. So it's a real test for Western democracies. Uh, former communication, let's do this this way. Former communications minister Stephen Conroy gave us the Finkelstein inquiry in 2012, which recommended a statutory news media council, self administered by the industry, but with mandatory, enforceable, prominent publication of corrections, adjudications, a set of settlement complaints after procedurally fair investigation by experts, getting some process of regulation to get fact-based news media, not distorting right-wing or left-wing propaganda media. Well, those recommendations were sound. And as you know, they were never taken up by the successor Australian government, the Abbott government, largely because the, the uh, Liberal Party has become a wholly owned subsidiary of Murdoch land. And the Murdoch newspapers act as a, an extended political protection racket for the Liberal Party. That's the way in which this, this thing works. Um, I think, um, and again, backtracking slightly in our conversation before coming to this idea of a media council, uh, is it is not just the marketplace that we're talking about and people's ability to make a buck uh, and uh, to maximise their market share uh, in what they're doing online or not online uh, in the news media space. As a democracy, we cannot simply stand idly by while Murdoch seeks through his new digital penetration uh, to um, uh, the um, uh, YouTube and YouTube Plus to create balkanized communities of political 
extreme opinion in Australia to render this democracy as ungovernable as the American democracy has in many respects now become, to create warring tribes as opposed to two competitive political traditions. And that is might serve Murdoch's business model because he creates a highly captured audience, as you've seen with Fox in the United States. But frankly, it's not in the interests of the Australian mainstream democracy, whether you're from the far right or the far left. If it was the International League of Tribune Writers, um, funded by the old Communist Party, the Soviet Union, uh, and financed by money out of uh, a combination of Cuba and Venezuela, I would have exactly the same view uh, on this question. And the final uh, point leading to this uh, core question about a, a, a media council is that the second cancerous effect of Murdoch doing this is the complete conflation of news and opinion, of fact and opinion. And in this brave new world of Murdochism, expounded through Fox, reflected in Sky, and now in the pages of the Murdoch tabloids, and now increasingly into their remaining broadsheet, the convergence of news and opinion into a single bucket of bile is of itself a deep danger. Therefore, that brings us to how do you act as a corrective the Australian um, Press Council is not worth the paper it's written on. Uh, this institution takes forever to answer a basic request from anybody seeking a correction or to seeking um, a, um, a reprimand of a media organisation for basic factual errors, uh, let alone uh, any challenge to questions of opinion. So it's basically not just a toothless tiger, it is a dead tiger. This is an ex-tiger, to paraphrase paraphrase Monty Python, uh, this tiger is no more. It is Gonski's. It's out the door. And so therefore, the question is, what do we replace it with? Uh, if it's to be industry-based, and I am firmly of the view that the industry should self-regulate, um, but if you don't self-regulate, and then the industry not only will need to have a media council of the type recommended by Finkelstein, it will need to also have a fundamental, agreed, corporately entrenched um, uh, minimum guidelines in terms of rate of response to complaints, appropriately staffed to deal with them, robust in taking on uh, media organisations who get facts wrong. Um, and at present, against those three tests, the existing dead tiger does none of the above. The question is, should it be statutory? Uh, should it be in legislation? Because Kim Williams, representing News Corp at the time of the Finkelstein inquiry, said wouldn't sign up to it because it would end centuries-old tradition of the Anglosphere's freedom of the press. Broadcast media is, is regulated through the Broadcasting Services Act in Australia uh, and in the United States uh, with uh, arguments about uh, uh, the level of uh, a complaint handling in that uh, jurisdiction, but it's regulated. The ABC is regulated, as is SBS, regulated. People can complain to the Australian Communications and Media Authority, but not print. Now, print is going to go. The, the, the print newspapers eventually, as people in bulk move to their devices, uh, to their digital devices, print will go. Should we not therefore seize the opportunity to, to statutorily regulate uh, the digital uh, print outlets or text outlets uh, and make them live up to higher standards to eliminate or try to eliminate disinformation. Because of um, technological convergence and the convergence ultimately of all platforms into single devices of one form or another, um, print, um, television, radio, cable, uh, digital, post-digital. Um, it makes no sense to have uh, one single, as it were, fact-checking mechanism, um, guidelines, as it were, uh, enforcing um, councils uh, to be, as it were, sub-industry specific, as opposed to across the entire media spectrum. So on that point, I agree with you. On the second one, which is, um, should it be statutory or not, uh, look, I'm a wise enough old bird to know that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. One of the reasons I want 
a royal commissioner to look at the alternative options for this is to come up with the best recommendation from what's available in the other democracies. All I can say at this stage, though, uh, Quentin, is that the current model in Australia has failed and it is dead. As for Kim Williams and the defence of the Anglosphere, give us a break. Kim's been the world's worst apologist for News Corporation's monumental assault, not just on the ABC, not just on public broadcasting, but on the whole future of media diversity in this country. Um, and I wouldn't take his opinion uh, with a grain of salt. And in terms of the future of the Anglosphere, pretty interesting question, the Anglosphere. Which of the polities in the Anglosphere have become most polarised and, in fact, um, in some respects, looking at the nature of their parliaments, the most systemically dysfunctional and dealing with big questions. The United States Congress, the United Kingdom, the Brexit debate, and potentially the fracturing of the union involving Scotland, and to some extent, this country, Australia, as well. Murdoch is a dominant presence or a major presence in all three of us. What are the other two members of the Anglosphere? Canada and New Zealand. Reasonably functioning democracies, pretty stable, either centre-right, centre-left governments. Guess what? No Murdoch in either. Go figure. Uh, in which case, uh, statutory regulation in the Anglosphere is warranted. You know, saying uh, fools rush in where angels fear to tread, but uh, it, we've still got these uh, the functions of, <laughs> hopefully, the functions of democracy, dysfunctional, as you uh, allege, because of distorting influence from disinformers and misusing or abusing their power, the power of freedom of the press, well, why can't we in all legitimacy uh, rein it in? Say, for example, Finkelstein's argument about a news media council with statutorily enforceable, prominent corrections of factual error. Opinions can rage. We don't want to be like Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party or uh, Putin's methodologies in, uh, in Russia, but we want to get a higher standard. So you're, as a lawmaker... Don't we have to change the law? Look, I'm a pro-freedom sort of guy, and I say that in not an American context, uh, where this term is bandied around as if it means nothing. And as someone who's lived in one-party states, myself in the future, I'm always very wary and leery about um, state control over the uh, dissemination of news and information. That's where I come from as a starting principle. Second principle is this. Industry self-regulation in print in this country is a complete and utter disgrace. And frankly, the press council should go out without any shred of honour and go out and collectively resign tomorrow because it is simply a charade. But thirdly, on the replacement, I'm sympathetic to the logic contained in Finkelstein's report. I'm familiar with it, but I want to defer that deliberation to the considerations of a royal commissioner. This is, not a, this is not a quick and easy fix, and I'd much rather have on a table in front of me, what are the 20 best um, media regulatory environments in flourishing liberal democracies around the world, and what can we actually discern from them for our own mix, not just on print, but across all media platforms? Now, as a vile journalist myself, I'm very well aware that the media... Uh, is somewhat united public broadcasters, uh, let alone uh, uh, Rupert and, uh, and uh, Fairfax, no, now nine, are desperately worried about defamation. And uh, it's extremely cost costly. It has a chilling effect on some of the good things the media does uh, in public interest exposure, investigative journalism, what have you, the things that I'm certainly concerned about uh, uh, maintaining the, the real value of investigative journalism. Couldn't we, we go get the media to accept a statutory news media council uh, with self-regulation, enforceable correction of factual uh, error in return for removal of the tort of defamation or at least some cap on punitive damages through uh, defamation law which exists in every jurisdiction, state, territory and commonwealth. This is the, uh, the Dempster grand bargain argument. Uh, we're going to call it the DGB, the, um, which is... Uh, can you have effectively a, um, uh, a um, universal, enforceable, 
uh, regulatory regime uh, tasked with the enforcement of fact-based reporting um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a reform to the defamation laws uh, to make, for example, public interest journalism a lot more navigable than it currently is. I think that's something to be explored by a Royal Commissioner. I think it's uh, the conceptual elements of the uh, the Dempster Grand Bargain, the DGB, has got something going for it. Um, um, but can I say right now, as someone who has initiated defamation proceedings against multiple media outlets myself uh, and prevailed in each of them before any of them got to court, um, uh, and that's been against the Canberra Times, that's been against the ABC, that's been against uh, elements of the Murdoch Empire as well, uh, at present, um, the non-predisposition for any uh, media outlet to own up to any error uh, of, um, shall we say, defamatory fact, uh, frankly, leaves people like me and with no other course of action either. And so, um, and, uh, and therefore, there is no predisposition currently on the part of the political class in this country to make defamation laws easier unless and until we were to move in the direction of the Dempster Grand Bargain. Um, but um, your Dempster Grand Bargain may be uh, seen by some as uh, as elusive as the Rudd Turnbull Royal Commission. But we'll see who comes first. Um, so you're saying to us that you've had satisfaction from uh, starting defamation proceedings to get some uh, some correction or some satisfaction, even though arguably your character has been well and truly assassinated by uh, by news corporation, um, well, and, or in the case recently by the ABC itself. I mean, there was a crazy program. I think on um, one of the investigative programs, um, which you, know, you you may remember for the benefit of friends of the ABC audience, where someone in the ABC investigative unit chanced upon some uh, some. Uh, cabinet files uh, in Canberra with a whole bunch oh. of uh, classified cabinet docs. And they had some junior woodchuck go in there, read them, and then pr pr present exposés of my perfidy and uh, crimes against humanity as prime minister. And the question of uh, the um, home insulation program, only to forget that all these matters had already been not only canvassed, dealt with and explicitly put on the table during a Royal Commission. So that's even the ABC. And you've got a high standards in the ABC go out there into cowboy land, which is Murdoch land, folk like myself who are just simply trying to protect their reputation, not, not build a swimming pool. Um, uh, we um, at present have very few tools available to us, as do, as do average members of the public. So therefore, there is wisdom in the Dempster Grand Bargain proposal, and that's something which should be part of the entree for a rural commissioner. The reason I'm saying is because uh, there's a lot of for what's called forum shopping. People are going to the federal court where there's no jury. I mean, there's, there's very uh, serious high stakes defamation actions that are going on in Australia at the moment. Um, uh, war crimes, uh, the Christian Porter versus the ABC case, uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, uh, involved. Uh, the lawyers are... are uh, uh, having a, uh, a field day on that. And it, uh, what I'm saying is it has a chilling effect. Uh, of course, I want reputations not to be unfairly traduced and people to have a right to have their reputations restored where media have gone over the top and, got, and buggered things up. But the public interest journalism that so benefits our democracy can be so stifled uh, by by defamation proceedings, particularly now with the with the forum shopping that goes on. In terms of public interest journalism and take you know flagship programs like Four Corners, and the enormous good work it's done over the years, and it, you know it's it's ripped into me on quite a number of occasions over the years. But that's just part of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Um, look, I'm all for um, uh, us having a robust public journalism, and if we can anchor the regulatory environment in a manner which achieves an effective balance between uh, the protection of fact-based reporting and the mandatory correction of fact-based reporting on the one hand and defamation law reform on the other, uh, then um, I would be a, a willing supporter uh, of, uh, of that approach. Uh, at present, it's a long way off, um, uh, but um, uh, if the media corporations are interested in bringing about such a reform, they should come to government with this 
sort of a combined proposal on the table. And so that it can be then worked through. You see, when it comes to the abuse of media power, here is a critique back at you guys who are died in the wool journalists like you, QED, which is um, very few journalists will ever hold other media outlets to account uh, when they radically screw up. Uh, for example, you try getting a story. Oh, media, from... come on, fair enough. Media Watch, Media Watch on the ABC. Uh, does, yeah. does the ABC have it? This is, uh, I was about to come to Media Watch and with a notable ex exception of Media Watch. Uh, and they do an excellent job either roasting the ABC. And for example, they came to my defense on the matter I just referred to against the ABC, which the CEO, then CEO of the ABC, had to issue a, a groveling two page apology to me over. So they do a great job. But you know, that's 15 minutes a week. Um, and, um, and it is mandatory viewing. Editors watch it, they hate it uh, from across the system. It's practically the only institutional corrective available in this country to cause uh, journalistic outlets, media outlets, professional journalists and editors to be in any way concerned, apart from then, as it were, the jaws of defamation law, which then opened before you. And frankly, we need to get beyond that. So in the campaign, for example, to um, hold Murdoch to account over his media monopoly and the abuse of that monopoly in Australia, you try getting systematic coverage on that question out of either the ABC or out of Fairfax 9. Frankly, you know as well as I do, the unwritten law uh, across most of the media outlets in Australia is that you never tackle each other on these questions. I think in terms of media diversity, attacking one another in terms of getting facts wrong is part of the mix, should be part of the normal mix. After all, Murdoch does that when the ABC screws up. Murdoch does that when Nine Fairfax screws up, there seems to be this deep culture of reluctance to take hold of the beast itself, which is Murdoch, and say, you regularly screw up facts other than Media Watch. Um, yeah, that's, it's a fair point, but I think it's improving, Kevin. Uh, I, I won't go into it with other examples, but I think it's uh, critical, being critical of other media on their facts uh, is, is improving and because the public consciousness about the failings of the media is now much higher, particularly with the digital revolution, which is what I wanted to get into in the next question, and maybe going at it this way, do you support the Josh Frydenberg and Paul Fletcher mandatory Google Facebook revenue sharing code, which seems to have forced the tech giants in this country to begin to pay for Australian-made news media content? No, I do not. Um, and it's not because I don't want to force the tech giants to, as it were, uh, contribute financially to Australian public interest journalism. I disagree with the model which, uh, fr uh, which uh, Frydenberg has negotiated. And the reason I disagree with him uh, is that it smells far too much of, a, again, a sweetheart deal, uh, which the News Corporation boys are very happy with in terms of... Um, how much how's your father you get out of uh, Google and Facebook on a given day. Um, that's one point. But the second is this. Look carefully at the uh, legislation. Uh, it provides the treasurer with enormous discretionary regulatory powers to determine what constitutes an Australian media content provider for the purposes of receiving payments uh, from Google, Facebook, or the other digital, uh, digital platforms around the world. So does that include, I think you grew up in Maribyrnong, didn't you, Quentin? Does I that did. include Maribyrnong Chronicle, which Mur Murdoch, I think, has put to death? Um, not sure. Uh, does it include what's left of the Mackay Mercury? Not sure. Uh, would it include an independent um, uh, community-based newspaper now trying to provide local news on the Sunshine Coast, where I grew up, given they've just killed the Sunshine Coast daily? Not sure. And how much, how much favouritism will be deployed by Frydenberg in the exercise of this extraordinary discretion? Well, Rod Sims says the ACCC, uh, the ACMA will give you the accreditation if you apply to be on the mandatory code, and they're going to review it uh, to see what the macro, the macro payments, if they can get some assessment, uh, to put a financial floor. The other the criticism uh, of uh, the mandatory code is it doesn't define public interest journalism. The, it's, uh, the, the money goes back to any local content creator, but it might, it might get, you, you have to give them some credit on this, Kevin, that they have got some money, uh, a world first in a sense, getting back to the, after the destruction of the local content 
creation industry, particularly in journalism? If that was the case, and as I said, I don't disagree with the concept. I agree with this execution, both around the non-delivery of explicit funding to public interest journalism and the extraordinary discretionary powers available to the Treasury to decide basically who's in and who's out of this regime. That's potentially an enormously corrupting power for any individual in that position. Uh, you mentioned Rod Sims before. Uh, Rod Sims should go and hide in a hole somewhere. Rod Sims is the guy who uh, basically, as the chief competition regulator, decided it was all fine and dandy to approve the uh, sale of Australian provincial newspapers to Murdoch back in 2017. Murdoch, hand on heart, saying we're going to invest in these newspapers for the future. Same story as you and I saw in 1987 with the Hawke and Keating government over what then happened with the acquisition of the Herald and Weekly Times Group. And then they took out um, a, a machine gun and then two or three years later, in this case under the cover of COVID, mowed down something in excess of 100 local newspaper mastheads in the country. Now, that's what Rod Sims delivers. So when Rod Sims comes forth and pronounces on the future of the digital media bargaining code, uh, I think it's not worth the paper it is written on. He is out of his depth on the question of media regulation. In terms of competition law for the rest of the economy, fine. With media, we're dealing not with the economy, we are dealing with the lifeblood of our democracy. I understand that, but uh, given the nature of what I call the, the global interlopers coming in over the top, getting the eyeballs of Australia's, Australians, including the video streamers, Stan, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, Prime, Amazon, and all those other things, because of the digital revolution, at least Sims got money, and, and Frydenberg, <laughs> he might call it a Rupert Murdoch shakedown, but they got money out of the tech giants and the rest of the world is looking at the Australian methodology to do that for uh, after the destruction of the local content industries. Don't you cut them any slack on, on that, given the enormous power of Google and Facebook? Uh, no, I don't, because it should have been constructed as a different deal. Um, and that means that uh, the um, requirement on the part of uh, Google and Facebook should have been to deliver direct funding to public journalism, direct fund public interest journalism, direct funding, in my judgment, also to the public broadcaster, though that came later in the changes. Uh, and also, um, as I said, this question of who's in and who's out. So as I said, the concept is fine. The execution, I believe, has been maximised in a direction to the benefit of good old news corporation, the Murdoch mafia. Let's not beat around the bush. 21 out of the last 21 federal and state elections, 21 straight, Murdoch has campaigned viciously using his platform on behalf of one side of politics against the other. That's not healthy when you control 70% of the print and prospectively have now a new, sl a new slug of cash coming in from the digital platforms, plus you're about to go into online gaming, uh, plus uh, you're running realestate.com, uh, plus you're, ex you're throwing out your bile uh, through um, the uh, YouTube channel, which is dedicated for the purposes of Sky News. So to then say to uh, Frydenberg, oh, I think you've done a great job, Josh, because you've just written another check for Rupert. Sorry, I won't sign up to that, Quentin. OK, I understand. But now let's talk about the, uh, the insurrection at the US Capitol. Uh, President Biden has got a big problem as well with dis disinformation, uh, not only in the United States, but globally. Uh, what is the uh, what is the possibility of is there a possibility of biden leading uh the democracies in the in getting google and facebook and the internet to stop disinformation to mitigate disinformation which is disrupting and making us look foolish and easily undermined by the authoritarians I think that's a, um, a really profitable question to explore, Quentin, uh, because in the past, as you know, questions of internet governance have tended to go in either of three directions. One, uh, where data, or now having lived in the United States for five years, data um, is, um, is the purview of the state. And that's essentially the Chinese and Russian model. The regulatory model applied in the authoritarian states is that uh, there is no privacy uh, and that uh, all data should be, as it were, accessed by the state. 
And that attitude to governance is reflected in how they manage the media more generally in those countries. Second, you have the American model, which is corporations should have uh, complete access to the data, whether it's Google, Facebook, or, um, or Amazon, or whomever. Uh, and the idea that uh, there should be some citizen's charter up the middle of that, uh, the people, we the people, uh, well, that's kind of alien to American corporate consciousness. But the tide of resentment against uh, the major tech platforms in the United States is growing and growing and growing, not just because they can see the balkanization of their own democracy, but they've also seen it used and abused, uh, not just in what happened at the 2016 elections um, uh, and, the, um, and the, the use and abuse of particular technologies to uh, undermine the then Clinton campaign and to advance Donald Trump's interests, uh, but uh, on top of that, you saw its active mobilization on the 6th of January in the storming of the Capitol. So there's now a reappraisement in America about uh, have we got these models right? And I think you will see a whole new set of proposals come out of the Biden administration on this. Third basket, of course, are the Europeans who seek in their own regulatory environment to put uh, the individual or the citizen first in terms of their digital privacy regimes not going to allow information to become quarantined by corporations, nor captured by the state, uh, will have uh, instead instilled within our systems and the regulation of those systems a protection of individual liberty. I suspect that where we'll land will hopefully be a transatlantic compromise uh, between Brussels and Washington on this, mindful of where the authoritarian uh, regimes are going with their use of these platforms against vulnerable democracies who are open societies, open economies, and with the exception of Murdoch, open media, uh, in order to, um, as it were, uh, make life and politics and uh, discourse within the democracies as problematic and as polarised as possible. So I think, watch this space for the Biden administration. I would say support them bringing about a, a um, shall we say, a democratic regulatory regime which could be amenable for use in multiple countries around the world. Uh, thanks for that, Kevin. Very valuable. We've got a couple of questions. We've got a, a whole list of questions, but I'll, I'll, it's uh, uh, given me an opportunity to look at uh, disinformation, which is the subject of our discussion, and uh, national security, particularly in the context of uh, the drums of war uh, with, uh, with China. Uh, Many journalists and Western media organisations are now desperately concerned about the ordeal of Julian Assange, still incarcerated in Belmarsh Prison. And now, we Australian journalists have appealed to President Biden to discontinue the extradition case against uh, Julian Assange. We argue Assange is a publisher through leak, uh, WikiLeaks. Under the US First Amendment, freedom of the press, US newspapers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, we're able to publish Daniel Ellsberg's Pentagon Papers, which exposed the misjudgments which led to the lethal folly of the Vietnam War. Assange published Chelsea Manning's leaks of war crimes and atrocities in Afghanistan and Iraq and other material. Surely Assange should not be jailed indefinitely for telling the public what is really going on. I agree with that. Um, and um, the um, Friends of Julian Assange uh, campaign came to me prior to the last US presidential election um, to um, enlist my support uh, with uh, the Trump administration, would you believe, um, with the government of the United Kingdom uh, on the question of this, uh, it, of this um, Assange extradition matter. Um, my position is pretty simple. Um, I think Assange was uh, grossly irresponsible uh, in terms of the leaking of uh, national security information and I say this as someone who's worked inside the system and I know the vulnerability of sources and the critical utility to which democratically elected governments uh, make of intelligence material. However, the bottom line is the protection of national security information is a responsibility of the government, it's not a responsibility of the media. And the fact is that uh, when stuff is uh, uh, leaked uh, to someone like Julia Assange and they, and they uh, then choose to uh, release it to mainstream media organizations. My view is this, if you're going to uh, conduct a Spanish inquisition into uh, Julian Assange, then you should do so also with the editors of The Guardian, New York Times, The Washington Post, everyone else who put this stuff out there in the public domain. 
And so this is in a completely hypocritical position in the United States between uh, protecting the freedom of the press to disseminate this information as far and as wide as you can see, and the prosecution of Assange and, of course, Manning the leaker um, for having uh, got this information uh, uh, extracted from the United States government in the first place. So my position is pretty simple. I can't stand Julian Assange. I think he's been absolutely reckless. However, I totally defend his legal rights, and his legal rights should not land him in the position where he is at the moment. He should not be the subject of extradition in the United States, and he should therefore be let free. Maybe they're just uh, going him because it sends a, que sends a, uh, a message to any other potential uh, whistleblower within the Five Eyes security agencies that we'll get you, we'll come after you. Do you have any sympathy or support for Edward Snowden? who as a matter of conscience, you talked about the courage of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, the, the uh, Edward Snowden, who put his uh, uh, life and liberty at risk uh, to reveal the illegal and unconstitutional uh, surveillance of the world's metadata uh, when, he, uh, when he went public uh, in uh, 2013. I'm backtracking slightly on Assange first and, uh, of course, Chelsea Manning. If you look at this carefully... Uh, the offences under national security law in the United States actually were committed by uh, Chelsea Manning, uh, and in my judgment, not by Julian Assange. He was the recipient of this information. The actual uh, government, as it were, officer or the government employee who leaked the information was Chelsea Manning. There's a separate entire debate about Chelsea Manning and the actions taken by the Obama administration uh, to um, uh, provide a, a pardon uh, for the crimes which uh, she had uh, committed. Um, but as I said, that's a separate category uh, from Assange, who, as I said, I do not believe in any conceivable world, um, whatever I might think of him personally, uh, and uh, some of the irresponsibility of his actions, that he should be the subject of um, extradition to the United States um, for um, uh, what uh, actions were initiated under the Trump administration. On Snowden... Um, look, um, Snowden, uh, too, was a government employee, um, and Snowden, therefore, is in the Manning category as opposed to the, um, uh, as opposed to the uh, Assange category. Um, and therefore, I'm reluctant to be drawn uh, on, um, uh, on uh, Snowden with the exception of saying this. And by the way, a lot of the Snowden stuff that was leaked, there's bulk uh, cables of all my conversations with uh, Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State when I was Prime Minister of Australia. So, look, it's, it's, it's never comfortable when this thing happens, particularly <laughs> when you think you're having a, a private diplomatic conversation. But uh, leave all that to one side. I think the, the core question you invoked Dietrich Bonhoeffer before as, um, as uh, an employee of the German Nazi state, a member of the Abwehr, which was German military intelligence when there's a former Lutheran pastor, he then participated in a plot to assassinate Hitler. Now, um, that, as you know, is an example in extremists. But the principle alive here is that if you're a government employee uh, and you discover in your work as a government employee uh, that, the, uh, uh, that you see things going on uh, which uh, within the system of government uh, are unlawful, um, and in breach of public sector ethics as clinically defined, not as subjectively defined, then you have a right within the systems to become whistleblowers within the systems. What I don't know in the Snowden case is whether he exercised those rights before he did his um, enormous dump, as it were, of all these material. And I'm not sufficiently familiar with the Snowden case to know whether he went through those hoops first uh, he, he, did, he didn't. He, he put it in his book. Uh, uh, yeah, it's all there in, in his book, what his, motivation, what his motivations were in, uh, in uh, leaking. And it's, uh, it's, been, it's been well covered and there's a lot of uh, support for him. But he couldn't get a pardon from uh, before uh, um, uh, Barack Obama left the, uh, left the White House or Trump. So uh, he's still over in, <laughs> in that flat in Moscow. 
That's right. Well, well, a few people have been there before, Burgess McLean and a few others, but the um, they've done some uh, interior redecorating since then. But the principle... But it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a... You're not implying, I know, that he was a Soviet spy, so he just happened to land there or, or he was trying to get into uh, into Germany uh, with the support of Angela Merkel. Yeah, but, the, but, the, but also, I mean, there's another relevant factor here, wearing another hat, which is which is when you put all this information out here, you are, by definition, uh, advantaging um, your... Russian and Chinese adversaries in many respects uh, from the American national security prism. All I'm saying is, having lived in both these worlds myself, um, uh, is that I respect it when officials um, are privy to information or the abuse of power within a system where the laws of that country are being violated by the actions being undertaken, or they are in breach of what I describe as defined principles of public sector ethics. So my challenge to Snowden would have been, uh, why didn't you uh, find an alternative recourse uh, before going to this step? And that well, could have been. Uh, it's been my experience as a journalist. Not in, I'm not a national security journalist, but uh, the if you do try, from whistleblowers, if you do try to raise things internally on an upward referral process within a hierarchy, the rule seems to be downwardly destroy those who upwardly refer. And many whistleblowers are moved to the door or are psychologically abused as a consequence and, uh, and, uh, uh, and are traumatised and ultimately out and it becomes a cover-up. That's why a lot of whistleblowers, Kevin, say, bugger it, I'll go straight to the media. That's true. And and other people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we mentioned before, were hanged um, by Hitler in the last couple of days of the war. So, um, look, I'm 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 apprised of the complexity of this debate. I'm not seeking to trivialise it, which is why I'm seeking to find, as it were, a navigable path up the middle. Yeah, uh, just quickly, just quickly, um, I need... Uh, to on this information, you would acknowledge, would you not, as a former prime minister and chairing of the National uh, Security Committee of Cabinet, that our security agencies have the capacity for disinformation, uh, the uh, and dirty tricks. Let me raise this one: the Australian Signals Directorate bugged the cabinet room of the government of East Timor, Timor Leste, Day, to get commercial leverage in negotiation over Woodside's exploration licences in the Timor Sea. Were you shocked when you heard that? Nice try, QED, but as a former Prime Minister of the country and as a former Foreign Minister of the country, I do not comment on intelligent matters. OK, I take that as read. Do you support the Commonwealth Government's prosecution of the Canberra solicitor Bernard Caleri and witness K, who exposed the bugging? Uh, under no circumstances do I support that. Uh, why? <laughs> Without going to the question of the operational matters uh, which pertain to the intelligence community, I do not believe, uh, based on my public review, of the public information associated with this case, that there is a prima facie case to be answered uh, by either of these individuals. Uh, can you tell us, um, yes, our security agencies are just as capable of dirty tricks and disinformation as uh, President Xi Jinping's uh, uh, Politburo or Vladimir Putin's Russia? I don't believe that's the case at all, Quinn. And I say that as someone who's been Prime Minister and as Foreign Minister... Bugging the, bugging the Cabinet Office of the Cabinet of East Timor. Quinton, I'm not speaking about any... Uh, allegation or substance of an operational matter uh, within the purview of the Australian intelligence services. But here's, let me roll back against you on a couple of points um, and put, put you out of your comfort zones for just a minute on this one, which is, I know where you're coming from, mate. Uh, but the bottom line is this, it's a rough old world out there. Um, and let me tell you, if you have some familiar, familiarity with state-based uh, intelligence operations against uh, democracies around the world, uh, that there, it therefore uh, requires our own intelligence agencies to be fully empowered, probably staffed, probably trained, probably resourced to do their job. And I say that not as a defence of a particular operation in a particular country, whatever that may have been. I'm saying it's an ugly world out there, a really ugly world. Second is my experience of the Australian intelligence agencies um, as uh, the former chair of the... Um, uh, of the National Security Committee of the Cabinet and also as a member of the Cabinet uh, of that committee when I was Foreign Minister and as the Minister responsible in the period 
when foreign minister for the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, uh, is that my experience of uh, the senior staff with whom I dealt, highly professional, highly respectful of the principles of our democracy, and in my experience of them, uh, there was not a risk, uh, in my experience of them, there was not a risk of them uh, operating outside the principles established under Australian law. Disinformation, Kevin, in the context of the drums of war with China, and uh, I suppose back to Murdoch in that sense, because uh, uh, they, they, they seem to me to be beating up the prospect of it, maybe for domestic, they want to win the next election, of course, we understand all that, but uh, there's a capacity for disinformation through uh, uh, an implied support of our intelligence agencies. Uh, uh, we've been through the process of uh, influence. Yours, uh, you, any work you've done uh, with China, for example, you'd have to register as a as a uh, as a potential uh, influencer for China. <laughs> Um, uh, all, all you guys who've got uh, international profiles uh, back into Australia have had to, to do that. Uh, there is the current uh, argument or, or um, uh, beating up on, uh, on China, part of a disinformation campaign pushed by our paranoid security agencies. Look, in terms of the current campaign, and you're right to call it a campaign, it's being driven very much at the political level. And the political level means Morrison, Dutton, um, the defence minister, whoever it happens to be on a particular day, um, and um, uh, also certain statements and actions by the foreign minister, and plus, I think, quite unprofessionally assisted by the current secretary of the Department of Home Affairs, um, uh, Pizzullo. Um, I believe um, that campaign is principally politically driven uh, with a view to creating the perception of an active, immediate and dangerous threat environment uh, for Australia in relation to China in order to create the circumstances for a car key election, as we used to call them, um, which is more comfortable terrain from the perspective of the Conservative parties than fighting on the future of economic recovery, the future of employment, the future of the health system and the future <clears throat> of uh, our education system. Parallel to that, you see a campaign to securitise, my term, the rest of the Australian political agenda. For example, the government's monstrous failures on quarantine, on vaccine, uh, on the initial um, herd immunity project, together with all points in between, is now masked in a new Morrisonian doctrine of, um, we're going to have Fortress Australia, uh, faithfully echoed through the bugles owned by the news, the media corporations of Murdoch to reinforce this notion of a national security agenda. These are both arms of a political agenda from the government. If you spend time with the individual employees of the Australian Foreign Service and the Australian, shall I say, uh, defence establishment, there are a vast range of differing views among senior personnel about the wisdom of any of the above. And so, therefore, I don't subscribe to the view that you've got this sort of avalanche of, uh, as it were, opinion across Department of Foreign Affairs or Defence or even necessarily across the intelligence agencies pushing the Australian government in the direction of its rolling rhetorical fusillade against Beijing. In fact, I know for a fact that many in the foreign policy establishment internally have been argued, arguing to the government uh, explicitly the reverse course of action. That's not to diminish national security threats from China, they're real, they're manageable. We had them when we were in office and we dealt with them without actually were creating the conditions for a khaki election. Yeah, but I'm very frightened about it uh, you know, because of, uh, of the, the follies of uh, uh, Vietnam and uh, Iraq. Uh, it's so frightening, Kevin, that uh, why can't uh, if this is a disinformation campaign uh, and arguably pushed by some of our security agencies who understandably have to be very well aware in the real world, as you say, of, uh, uh, of the malign forces that are going on. Why can't we get an accurate picture from those agencies to the Australian public, from DFAT, for example? Uh, is it, it's all uh, under, the, under the Westminster system of ministerial control and all the, all the uh, communication with the public has to come through uh, uh, the politically, uh, the elected minister. 
Well, for example, um, you're right to raise that as a legitimate question. How do you find a way through to the facts without, as it were, compromising national security sources uh, to purvey a balanced view to the Australian public as to what constitutes the on balance you know, threats to Australian national security, whether they are arising uh, from actions uh, in our region or beyond our region, conventional threats, non-conventional threats, cyber and the rest. I tried to do something about this in office by initiating a, a practice of, of a national security annual statement to the parliament, which was in turn to, in, which was timed to simply lay out the texture of this. I think what you put forward is something, something which is probably uh, builds on that, which is if you were to do such a thing annually, then you could have an annual public briefing to the relevant public, uh, relevant parliamentary committee, uh, for example, the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence, with the senior uh, bureaucrats of defence, foreign affairs and elsewhere, uh, answering a, a range of basic questions, as happens regularly, for example, in the United States, and congressional appearances by um, the various heads of those agencies. And you'll find uh, the agencies often reflect a diversity of opinion. So I see this problem in Australia, Quentin, and I know what you mean by about Vietnam. My brother was a Vietnam vet. Um, I know what you mean about Iraq, um, together with um, the then leader of the opposition, but also my prime minister led the charge against the war in Iraq and was the prime minister who withdrew our forces from Iraq, um, despite all the challenges that presented in management of the, of the alliance with the United States at the time. I am super alert to the, to the dangers which you point to, which is why, among other things, quite apart from my campaign in relation to Rupert Murdoch, I've been pretty vigorous in the public debate on Australian China strategy at present, in what I've written in the press, uh, the interviews that I've given, et cetera, belling the cat to the large extent that I can against the false notion of um, an impending national security crisis in Australia represented by the rise of China. China represents a huge and vast array of strategic challenges to this country, but to reduce it to a, a weekly rhetorical fusillade out of uh, Morrison's office and out of Dutton's office almost competitively in order to out hairy chest ourselves on this question and then to slowly talk our way into uh, unnecessary military engagements. Look, the Tories are marvelous at getting this country into wars and they're rotten when it comes to getting us out of wars. Kevin, uh, you've been very generous with your time. I think we've come to a lovely landing of transparency as an antidote to disinformation uh, in general first principles, I suppose we could say. Uh, so I'm uh, very grateful to, uh, uh, for your thinking and your brain space on, on all those issues. It's, uh, and thanks to the Hawke Centre and uh, ABC uh, Friends for sponsoring this uh, exchange. I'd now like to throw back to Professor Rick Saar, Professor of Law at the University of South Australia. Thanks, Quinton. It falls to me to have this pleasant task of offering a vote of thanks on behalf of you all and wrapping up this session this evening. Uh, it's been a terrific evening. We've had the indomitable Kevin Rudd uh, taking us through and exploring this whole idea of the weaponization of media and then the remarkable Quentin Dempster for leading us through this, uh, this minefield of what is best for Australia in terms of its democratic uh, principles uh, and the media that we have endure, enjoy, depending on the word you want to use. Mind you, Quentin's also given his name to the Dempster Grand Bargain, uh, something that the Hawke Centre might want to explore in due course. As we've seen tonight, so Quentin is not averse to asking the hard question. And indeed, Kevin Rudd is not averse to, uh, to coming back uh, in his own way to, uh, to answer it in a fashion that uh, is, I believe, quite remarkable. Um, let's also thank also uh, the, um, the Hawke Centre for taking us to this topic, not just looking at the global media interlopers, but trying to explore the best form uh, of policies that Australia could deliver to ensure that our democracy is not threatened by the media that we have. Uh, guaranteeing our democracy and finding the best forum is something that uh, the Hawke Centre takes very seriously, and I'm delighted by that. The co-host tonight uh, was the uh, ABC Friends. Uh, it's a community organisation committed to the sustainable funding of the ABC. 
uh, without commercial or political interference. And any of you who have lived in the United States, as I have for any period of time, would know um, of the, the paucity, uh, the hand of mouth existence of the public broadcasting service they have in that, in that country, which uh, is uh, completely overshadowed uh, by the commercial and political interests that run the rest of the media in that place. So it is my view, and I support ABC Friends uh, because we need to have a sustainable public funding uh, broadcaster, and in fact is fundamental to our democracy. So that's it from me. Thank you once again to the Hawke Centre, to ABC Friends, and particularly to Kevin Rudd and Quentin for leading us through tonight's discussion. I bid you farewell.